This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Jake doesn't need a lot of introduction, but let's let him do it rather than me. Uh, and let's turn off all telephones, <laughs> uh, first of all. Anybody whose phone goes off has to give a $500 contribution to the company. <laughs> People dive for their <laughs> <laughs> Now, Jake, you began life in Florida. <laughs> how did you get here? I, There's well, an I, open door. Uh, wow, how did I get here from Florida? <laughs> I was born in Florida, but we left there when I was, what, a year old? I'm, I'm asking my mother in the front row. Um, <laughs> about a year old, right? About, really? Um, and uh, then we moved to um, Southern California, and then when I was five, we moved to Ohio. And so my formative years were in Ohio. That's where I started studying the piano. Um, those are my, re my real first memories. Um, there was music, uh-oh. <laughs> there, was, there was music everywhere um, when, when I was growing up. My father was an amateur jazz saxophonist. Uh, my sisters were listening to their music. Movie musicals were, were um, happening, and The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins. And, there just seemed to be music everywhere. I seemed to notice it everywhere. And so I started playing the piano at some point, and um, uh, I just fell in love with it right away. Where and did you study music formally, though? Um, well, formally, I, I didn't really study formally until I took private lessons. And you know, I was, I was going to say, I, I really didn't study formally uh, at an at a institution until uh, I went to UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, but in my teen years, I studied privately with wonderful teachers who were very nurturing and very supportive. And uh, my family was very supportive. Um, my father died uh, when I was very young, um, when, when I was 10. And I sort of immediately buried myself in, in music. And I found great uh, solace and refuge. I felt very empowered and identified in music. And around 11 years old is when I thought, I wonder if I could write it. And so I bought some manuscript paper, and I just started trying to write. And at that point, I was interested in writing big, flashy piano pieces um, uh, that meant absolutely nothing but looked really impressive. <laughs> and I was also, um, I also wrote a lot of, uh, I started writing ballads, like from Broadway shows or, or pop ballads. I loved listening to Barbra Streisand and Carly Simon and Joni Mitchell. and. Um, again, musicals, musicals, musicals. I really didn't know about the operatic or the trained voice at that point. The, the classic literature that I knew was Beethoven and Bach and Chopin and Debussy and all the things I was learning <coughs> in my piano lessons. Um, <coughs> so I, and after I graduated, uh, we moved from Ohio to Northern California, and I really fell in love with Northern California mm -hmm. and want, knew I wanted to go back someday. Studied with another wonderful teacher. And, then, and people kept telling me at that point I needed to go to UCLA to study with this wonderful teacher, Joanna Harris. And I, I started studying composition with a, with a teacher named Ernst Bacon mm -hmm. in the um, Bay Area. And Ernst Bacon had been Carlisle Floyd's teacher when Carlisle was 17. And I was 17 when I studied with Ernst Bacon. Yeah, so there was just a difference of a few decades between when we studied, <laughs> when we were age 17. But Ernst was in his 80s when I studied with him, and he was just a really encouraging, wonderful man. And he actually is the one who introduced me to Dickinson and Whitman and, and told me, you can actually take these poems and make settings of them. This was all new to me at that age. And, um, and then I met some friends who were more classically trained. Then I went to Europe for two years and studied in Paris um, and traveled all over Europe and had that experience and then went to UCLA to get serious. And that's when um, I started studying with Joanna Harris, uh, did a lot of two piano music, a lot of chamber music, and started writing for, um, for singers because there were so many in the department. Um, I have to say the Mozart Requiem was a piece that sort of turned me around with classical singing, and then the operas that we started to listen to. But I still didn't get operas themselves, because we kept listening to them. We didn't go to see them. And I realized that opera is theater music, you know, and it's only part of a, of a bigger picture. It's meant to be staged. It's meant to be experienced 
with live staging and scenery and costumes. And there are very few operas that work entirely just listening to the music. You have to have a point of reference for staging and visuals and action. And uh, when I saw Peter Grimes in LA with John Vickers, all of a sudden I had this wake up aha moment of what it could be. But it was, a, it was a slow progression towards opera and towards that part of the theater world. And even then, I didn't really think of myself as a theater composer. I thought of myself as a songwriter and someone who loved chamber music. Um, and then I had a, a, a big um, situation where I was playing the piano a lot and writing and teaching some. And I developed what's called a focal dystonia where my hand curled up into a fist. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to stop playing the piano. And this is when I was about 28. I withdrew from my last year of school without finishing my degree. I did finish it 17 years later. <laughs> <laughs> but I withdrew and I stopped composing. And I got a job uh, in a performing arts organization in Los Angeles, running a, a small series. And then I worked at the UCLA Center for the Arts because I found that even though I couldn't be in music at that point, I could be adjacent to it and write about it and support it from a different level. And I had a lot of knowledge from all of my experience as a performer and a writer. And uh, I was able to write very well press releases, speeches, anything they needed written. And, um, but eventually, living in Los Angeles became a, a gloomy place for me because I felt like there were so many ghosts around from a career that never happened that and I kept having reminders of it. It was very, very dark. And so I moved to San Francisco, where I had always wanted to be. And I got a job that had not been open in, I think, 20 years at the San Francisco Opera in the PR department. And I was the writer for the company. I was writing press releases and speeches and um, all kinds of things. And even though I wasn't at that point, nobody knew me as a composer, nobody really knew me as a pianist, I had gotten my hand back through it re-education so I could play again. And I was watching productions be put together from the, from the ground up. The first thing that I was, I, was, I started in 94, and uh, the first production I saw was uh, The Dangerous Liaisons um, that I was actually working on, where it was, uh, we were building a world premiere. It was Conrad Sousa and Philip Littell, and it had a cast that included some unknowns, like Frederica von Stada, Rene Fleming, <laughs> Thomas Hampson, um, it was really stunning, and I got to know all of these artists because I had to interview them, take them to the radio station. I had to write releases and stories and, and everything. And I, but it wasn't just about singers, it was about the orchestra, the conductor, the costume department, um, backstage, front of house, administration. You know, I was getting to know, what I didn't realize was it was the best apprenticeship I could have hoped for, but I didn't realize it at the time. I had no idea I was going to be an opera composer. Um, but these sing singers inspired me so much. The beauty of their voices, the passion, they were so much fun to be with. And I got, I flicked Frederica von Stade in particular, and she became a very good friend. And for opening night of the Dangerous Liaisons, I made three folk song arrangements for her and gave them to her as a gift. And with a slight look of terror in her eyes, she said, what are these? <laughs> 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 from somebody, somebody in the publicity from the PR department. department right, yes. right. Oh, good, the PR guy writes songs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I have to say, she's such a wonderful person that she, um, she said, "Well, I'm going to come in early the next performance and let's read through them." And so I was playing for her, you know, in the chorus room, thinking, "Well, it won't never get better than this. This was my dream, especially her." who was an, you know, she was an artist that I, I heard in Los Angeles singing Cenerentola and Carabino and all kinds of wonderful roles. And um, right after I finished playing them and she sang through them, she said, she said, you know, Jake, these are really good. Do you want to do a concert together sometime? And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, that would be OK. I would do, do that. And, and so, so you thought she was of your standard. Uh, <laughs> She's so sweet. You know, she's one of the dearest, greatest people on the planet and completely authentic. And she has this magical way of making everyone feel so important and valued. And uh, I could tell she was serious. She wasn't just saying that. 
And then she said, I want you to send your songs to Marty Katz, and I want you to send them to Matthew Epstein and Marilyn Horn, and you need to give them to Tom. He loves New American Songs, and you know, all of these people. And so with that, luckily, you know, I had a wonderful, great singer who also liked to blab, you know? <laughs> and so she, she started telling everybody about this guy in the PR department who was writing songs. And, <laughs> and after a while, the strangest thing was happening. The artists that were coming through the Opera House would come to the PR department, not to see about their interviews, but to ask if I had a song for them. It was an amazing time. I'll never forget it. It was like the world was changing day by day. And I thought, well, I could live like this. I could be someone <laughs> who writes you know, for the San Francisco Opera, does all their press and their things. And then at night and on weekends, I write songs. And, and this is where things really changed, because, yeah, because it was there that the whole idea of dead man walking well, came. Well, what happened was um, I didn't know that Latvi Mansouri, who was then the general director, had been paying attention to all of this. And Patrick Summers, who's a great conductor mm -hmm. and friend. Um, and they, one day at a party, Latvi said to me, so you're writing all these songs that my singers are doing for you and all over the world they seem to love them. He goes, have you ever thought about writing an opera? And I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about it. Seemed insurmountable to me at that yeah. point. And uh, he said, well, we should talk. And it was a party and I thought he was making nice small talk. And um, the next day I was at my desk and the phone rang and um, his assistant said, uh, Latvi would like to see you for a meeting. And so I brought my pad and ready to take whatever he needed from me. And uh, he said, so put the pad away and let's talk about your opera. Um, we have a slot in the 2000-2001 season. I'd like to send you to New York to meet with Terrence McNally, who I've really wanted to, be, uh, to persuade write a libretto. And I was like, who are you talking to? <laughs> you know? It was, it was just one of the, those moments, and I, was, I, was, I said, you're really serious about this? And he said, absolutely. He said, um, this, these singers love doing your work, and you have a real knack for writing for the voice, and you tell stories, and I think you're a theater composer. And so he sent me to New York. I met with Terrence, and even though it took us a while, one day Terrence said to me in 1997, he says, I'd like to do an opera based on Dead Man Walking. And, and boy. At that point, this, this part of the story is funny too. Latvi had said specifically because it was the millennium, he wanted a comedy, something, <laughs> something light, <laughs> something light and celebratory and bubbly. And, and, and Terence had said, I think we should write something meaningful and powerful, which is the best way to mark the occasion. And boy, you should have seen Latvi's face when we told him. I said, we went into his office and, and I said, Terrence, you tell him, because <laughs> I was still working for him in the PR department. <laughs> and uh, Terrence said, we want to do Dead Man Walking. And Lafayette, I have to say, even though he was like taken aback, like most people were, because it wasn't what they were expecting, um, but that's a good response, hmm. to be taken aback and surprised. And, and then he went, I never would have thought of it, but what a great idea. Let's go for it. And so right away, we went for it. And that's how that, that happened. That was in 97. And in 98, I became the composer in residence at the San Francisco Opera. And in 2000, uh, October 7th, um, Dead Man Walking opened. When Dead Man Walking, of course, has now gone all around the world, mm -hmm. many productions, uh, including in places like Germany. Yes. Uh, there are more coming up in the future. So that yes. was a major turning point. Oh, it was the turning point. And yeah. since then, uh, you've think, done... I think when Flicka agreed to sing my songs and asked me to write was one, and then when Lotfi asked me to write that, and then when it opened so successfully. And the, the good thing is you had Lotfi, a great man of theater. Yes. And to trust you like that yes. is and, rather and remarkable. Not only to trust me, but to give, give, to give the piece every opportunity to succeed. Yeah. You know, he did it at the highest level possible. I had Susan Graham, I had Frederica von Stada, I had the cast that I wanted, I had Terence McNally as librettist, Patrick Summers as my conductor, Joe Mantello in doing his one and only opera production. And, you know, he surrounded me with support and greatness so that everybody uh, could succeed in, in the environment. And, it made all the difference. I mean, new operas are so fragile. Terence said it's like growing orchids in Alaska. 
you know, and the odds really are stacked against you. You know, if you think of the 19th century when it was a for-profit popular art form, people were churning them out because it was profitable and it was, people wanted new work. They loved new work. It was very rare that you did old operas in that day. I mean, nobody knew about Handel's operas. They weren't done for 200 years nearly. But, you know, in this day and age, it's not the, the popular art form and entertainment. So the odds are stacked against you from the beginning. So to go in, what Latvi knew was you have to go in with the highest level possible so the piece has a chance to succeed. Well, let's move on from there now yeah. and, and move on to Moby Dick, mm -hmm. your latest opera. There have mm -hmm. been several in between, mm -hmm. uh, very successful, and I understand... Four full-length operas in 10 years. It was which, like, that's which when is I a went, pretty good achievement. Writing Dead Man Walking is when I realized, oh, I'm a theater composer, and everything fell into place. And but clearly you'd, you'd almost grown up in theater for such a period, and as you yeah. say, absorbing all of those elements. You knew what was needed yeah. to be delivered on the stage. Yeah. Now, Moby Dick. And I love singers. I do love singers. Which is quite, <laughs> a, quite a remarkable thing in itself, I, I must say. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I love singers. Moby Dick, a huge novel, many, many themes through it. How did you come to the idea of trying to condense that into an opera in the first place? Because it looks impossible. Well, um, first of all, it was Terence McNally's idea. And when he suggested it, uh, it was for the Dallas Opera. They were going to open a new opera house, the Windspear Opera House. And uh, it, Jonathan Pell had asked me, you know, um, what would you be interested in doing? And so I happened to be in New York, and I asked Terrence, well, what, what, would, what would we do? And he said, well, there's only one opera I want to do, and that's Moby Dick. And I went, Moby Dick. Uh, and I thought about it, and I looked in his eye, and I saw this twinkle and this smile, and I knew that it was going to be possible because he's such a great man of the theater. And um, I called up Jonathan and I said, um, Moby Dick. And he goes, anything else? <laughs> 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 and once I convinced him that it was the piece that I really, really wanted to do, and the more I thought about it, the more I got excited about it. Because again, it's a piece where you go, how is that going to be possible? How are they going to do that? But that's a great place to start. If you, if you start from a place of, oh, well, that's obvious, then all the surprise and the terror is gone. And I find that terror is a good thing for me as a composer, you know, to challenge myself. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, I, was, I was saying to my mom's music class earlier today, uh, when I take on a project, especially something the size of an opera, it has to be something that's going to sustain my passion and interest for at least four years, which is usually the time from the ask to the premiere is about a four-year period. So it has to be something that I'm excited about, but it also is going to have to be something that the audience is intrigued with, right? That the public feels connected to and still feels relevant and also challenging, like, how are they going to do that? I even remember a certain general director who shall remain nameless saying to me, I just don't understand how you're going to do this with you know, all that water and boats and whales. And I was like, have you seen Wagner's ring cycle? <laughs> <laughs> you think this is challenging? <laughs> now, Terence didn't finish up doing the libretto. No, he, had to, he had to withdraw for personal yeah. reasons, unfortunately. But I, I wound up being able to go to my good friend, Gene Shear, who I'd worked with many times. And Gene is a brilliant uh, wordsmith. And he's, a real, he's got a real poet's soul. Um, he's also a composer. He's a composer, but his heart is in the theater. Mm. He's a songwriter, and he's a, he's a really gifted songwriter. Um, he wrote American Anthem that was used by Ken Burns for the World War II series, um, sung by Nora Jones, and Denise Graves has recorded it, so has Nathan Gunn. He's had a lot of success with his songs. But he also is just a really brilliant uh, writer and librettist. And he's, you know, that's a process that takes a lot of time to develop, just like composition. And he's had some wonderful opportunities. And we found each other at just the right time and did uh, several song cycles together, as well as our first opera project was uh, a piece for Frederica von Stade called Three Decembers, the three character opera that we did for Houston Grand Opera. And then when Terence uh, had to withdraw, I went to Jean. And Gene had that same look like Moby Dick. And he said, let me read the book first. And so he, he read it and he said, you know what? I think it may be the best idea ever 
So how did you decide on the themes that you were going to pull out of well, that book? Well, there were three things that I took away from Terence that were very, very helpful that we kept. One was that Ahab was a Helden tenor, and more specifically that Ahab was Ben Hefner. That was our model. Who sings it here in San yes, Diego. Yes, and who sang the premiere. And who said yes right away before he'd even heard a note, which was very uh, encouraging. Um, two, that the whole piece was set on the water. So we never went back and forth from between land and water. Um, so that it was really a sea epic and adventure. Three, that Pip, the cabin boy, would be a soprano pants role. So you would have a female voice in there. Um, those three things were terribly helpful. And then when I got back to, to, to Jean, I suddenly had this idea. I said, Jean, what if instead of the first line of the opera being Call Me Ishmael, what if it's the last line? What if we really earn that line? You know, what if we build everything up to that line? What does that line really mean? And what we discovered it meant was that the opera was about the creation, the formation of this character who would ultimately survive all of this good and evil and horror and still want to live and survive, but would want to be known as Ishmael. This is the person who would survive all of this and then years later write the book that we know as Moby Dick. That freed us up tremendously because if he's going to become a writer at the end, that means we can just create or suggest events that would inspire a writer's imagination years later. So that was, was key. Then it was narrowing down the characters. I read the book a couple of times. Jean read it a couple of times. Then we put it away. And we thought, now what still resonates with us? Uh, we went to Nantucket to go to the Whaling Museum there and to really get started and looked at the artifacts, talked to people, found out about the actual ship, the Essex, which um, was the whale ship in 1820 that was rammed and sunk by a sperm whale off the coast of Argentina. Um, there was an author named Nathaniel Philbrick, who we met in Nantucket, who had written a novel called In the Heart of the Sea, historical uh, fiction, based on the events of the Essex. And that story of the Essex is what inspired Melville to write Moby Dick. Um, and Nathaniel Philbrick, we had dinner with him and his wife, Melissa. He's a brilliant man and a brilliant writer, and I'd highly recommend reading that book. I read that book, and the whole world of Moby Dick came to life for me. Um, and suddenly, uh, we realized that the central journeys, there's, there are two central journeys. There's Ahab versus Starbuck. Ahab, who's in control of everyone's physical life on that ship. Starbuck, his first mate, who's the only one who really sees Ahab for who he is. This great, charismatic leader who is going insane who is probably manic depressive. The, the way Ahab acts, he probably is manic depressive, but really losing it and lost in this uh, obsession. So he is manic depressive, obsessive compulsive, deeply wounded, aching man, who's also uh, kind of mercenary in the way, the way he uh, views his job, like a soldier that has to keep going back to battle or an actor that keeps going on the stage. You know, I just heard that Carol Channing is going to do another show. She's, you know, I mean, I hate to compare Carol Channing with Ahab, but you know, it's like, it's like that drive, you know, is unbelievable. So when you think of Ahab with this drive to just keep going back, especially now to conquer this, this thing that has offended him so deeply on such a spiritual level. so. Ahab controls everyone's physical life. Starbuck is the one who sees the madness. He's the only one who sees it. And Starbuck sees the whole ship voyage as a way to make money to get back home and be with his family. There, there's a wonderful duet, in fact, mm -hmm. between the two of them yeah, towards the that end. reflects that very right. well in the end. When Ahab the has end. a slight moment of lucidity. Yeah, and he actually becomes human yeah. for a moment or two, which well, is I think quite he marvelous. Becomes, we, we see a human side of him. We see glimpses of it through the first act, but it isn't until the, towards the end of the second mm -hmm. act when even he realizes it's too late. And then this character Greenhorn, who will become Ishmael, um, the character that calls himself Ishmael, he's, he's this unformed, lost, depressed young man who decides to go on the ocean to find meaning in his life, to find connection. And where does he find it? 
but with the most unlikely person, the spiritual center of the ship, this pagan, heathen, South Seas prince named Queequeg, who's the primary harpooner, mm -hmm. who becomes not only kind of a soulmate and a great friend, but a real guide for him. So their journey is sort of the emotional, spiritual journey. Um, so we have sort of this physical and this spiritual world going on at the same time. So those parallel journeys became very, very clear. Mm -hmm. um, Pip, um, who goes mad and becomes kind of a seer, is kind of the heart of the ship. He reminds everyone of what's so fragile and what's at stake, because there's a moment when Pip is lost at sea. Stub and Flask, the second and third mates of the boat, um, for their role on the ship in terms of organizing everything and also as comic relief, um, which we desperately need. Um, and then the other characters, the, this huge men's chorus, and the sea. The sea is a very important character in this. The whale itself, we wonder, is it like the moon where the whale represents whatever we project on it? I mean, ultimately the whale is a whale. Does it know that, you know, Ahab's mad at it? Does it know that people are obsessing over it? You know, I mean, that's, that's a question that people, you know, can interpret. I think it's a whale, you know? Let's I think it's more about the people's obsession with the whale than the whale itself. Well, know? let's get to the sea for a yes. minute, because um, what I found the moment I heard it in mm -hmm. Dallas, and it's now been performed in Dallas and Adelaide, mm -hmm. South Australia, it then is being performed in Calgary, then mm -hmm. with San Diego Opera, and on it goes to San Francisco, mm -hmm. and at least three or four other companies that have yeah. already wanted to take it on. I think they'll discover what I did, and that is, in the prelude itself, mm -hmm. you immediately smell the sea. It's quite a remarkable achievement. Could you let us hear a little bit of the prelude? Sure. And give um, us a sense of what the themes are in the opera. Right. I'm very big on uh, themes, uh, motifs, light motifs, rhythmic, melodic motifs, harmonic motifs. There is one chord progression that somehow I found that uh, encapsul it encapsulates, for me, basically the whole journey. It, it was the core of the sound world for the opera. When I'm writing an opera, I have to find a musical universe in which all those characters can live um, so that the music is of a piece, even though they each have their individuality. Um, and I don't, I, for the longest time, I didn't know where it, com it came from. Um, and it's a four chord theme. It's just this. I'll do it down here. Just those four chords. And it just, it just has this feel of rise and fall. There's a, there's a yearning to it, just those four chords. And from that, and throughout the opera, it, there, it's, it appears in many, many different permutations. Um, the other theme that, that, that happened very quickly was uh, Queequeg, who opens the opera, um, chanting to his idol. Gene uh, found a text for him, uh, a South Seas text that I set. And uh, there's a line, one of the lines that, that constantly goes through is this. And so this theme represents Queequeg, and a lot of things develop from that. So we have, and we have, and we also have a theme for Ahab, which is just, which is just, I'm sorry. Just that very simple, right? And we also have another theme that developed, which was death to Moby Dick, which is the rousing call when Ahab is trying to get everyone on his side. And that you hear is just very simply, death to Moby Dick, right? Um, it was interesting though, when I, when I, uh, after fin when I got to the end of the opera, I finally figured out what that chord is. Call me Ishmael. 
and it permeates the whole piece and it starts the piece too. I'll play you a little of what, what the prelude sounded like when I wrote it in my studio. <laughs> and then we have a recording from the premiere of the, of the prelude. The design team waited until they heard the score played through. It was me on the piano, but they waited until they heard the music before they started to work, which was terribly moving because they really took, you know, you could go from the libretto, but the libretto is going to give you just so much information. I mean, in, a, in an opera, the music ultimately has to lead and it gives you all the information about these, this other life beneath the sea, beneath this, the, the surface of the skin. And, uh, and they waited to hear that before they really designed, and I found that terribly moving. And it reflect, it's reflected in this beautiful production that is, uh, it's, it's remarkable for, for many, many elements. It's vast, it feels big, it feels energetic and exciting, and yet can feel so intimate, too. And it ha it's full of visual surprises. It's, it's, a, it's a very exciting It piece. actually needs some acrobats because of the masts they have to run up and the way the the whaling ships are done. Mm -hmm. And while we're here, actually, mm -hmm. those are being auditioned. Oh, really? <laughs> down at the Civic Theater. We're trying to find people who are prepared to climb masts and take, uh, take all of those risks. Oh, you should have seen the, the first day of rehearsal when we were on stage during the premiere, when the tenor, Stephen Costello, and Jonathan Lamalu, who, would, who played Queequeg, and all these other singers, came out, and they saw the mast they were going to have to climb and then sing <laughs> from. And, Jonathan Lamalu, who is afraid of heights, just went out there and went, oh. He used, he used a couple of expletives, which I'll spare you, but, but they, <laughs> he just basically walked off, just going, I can't, I can't. But he sure but did. But he did, he, he did. They all, yes. they all challenged themselves, and, and it is just thrilling to watch people going up and down those masts and, and see these sails coming in and out and these 
wonderful use of, thrilling use of um, three-dimensional computer graphics and projections. It's very, very exciting. On, on our stage, it's actually uh, one of the most impressive things we've ever done, and there's technology used that we have never used mm -hmm. before. And I've seen the production now in Dallas and also in Adelaide, and the cast in each production mm -hmm. was really quite different. There were one or two that were consistent, mm -hmm. but it works whatever the cast is, which I thought was very, very remarkable. Sometimes a new opera is built around one singer, mm -hmm. and if that singer isn't there, is it going to work? Well, I can assure you this is a work mm -hmm. that has a life anywhere because although it requires quality singers, we can find them mm -hmm. in, in opera theaters. And here in San Diego, many of the cast are the same as Dallas mm -hmm. because as we entered into the project with the other companies, I was constantly communicating with Jonathan mm -hmm. Pell in Dallas, who did a remarkable job mm -hmm. in making this happen. Mm -hmm. And we talked about every role. So mm -hmm. when you come to it in San Diego, many of the people are the same, yeah. I think there's only which is great. I think there's only one person who's new to the role, Yeah, right? Jonathan Boyd yeah. uh, as Greenhorn. That's right, right? because uh, our Stephen Costello is not available in right. our dates, and then we moved the dates, yeah. <laughs> and he would have been available. <laughs> but I'm very happy with, with Boyd. Oh, He's going yeah, to be terrific. Be but that, that's always very encouraging in writing an opera. I write for characters. I write for the roles. But I have to know the singers that I'm dressing them on. Um, it just really, I'm very visual as a theater composer. I have to, I have to imagine how it can be staged uh, who's going to be singing and what they'll look like, what I'll feel like in the audience watching all of that happen. And uh, so when I know who the singers are, it just makes all the difference. Then I can really write freely um, because that takes one, uh, one other unknown quantity out of it for me. I want to talk about how you get to that. Um, we did a sing-through of the work, a work-through in San Francisco mm -hmm. um, quite early in the piece. Hearing your music sung by those voices then, did it make you rethink any of the roles, any of the scoring, or were you fairly satisfied even no, at that was, point? No, it was, uh, what, what the workshop is about is really learning the dramatic pacing, hearing it sung, is the tessitura too high, too low, is, are there optional notes that I could write in, those kinds of things um, I, I'll learn, and also learn from the singers because I'll, I'll ask them, please tell me, is, there, is that vowel uncomfortable up there? Is there a better vowel? What would work better for you? Is there a word that you're having trouble saying you know, when you're singing up there? And so little things like that will get tinkered with. But dramatic pacing in an opera is so key. And it's, I think, very often overlooked. Yeah. And what, what I need from the beginning is I have to have, well, I'm the composer, I have to have the, the librettist, the, the director and the conductor all lined up and I have to know those people and trust them as a team. Then I have to have nothing but friendly ears around me for perspective because it is so easy in something that massive to take a wrong turn and go off track. So to have someone who's always asking questions, always asking the right questions, and then a chance to read through it and really learn about the piece, the pacing of the piece, what it's doing, and where it needs cutting or where it could use some more, and um, mostly it's cutting. <laughs> but I'd rather cut, actually, than write extra material. Um, so, and, and as a composer, what happens is I get too close to material. I fall in love with, oh, but isn't that pretty? Isn't that pretty? And they're like, yeah, it's pretty. It'll be prettier somewhere else. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's pretty long. So, <laughs> the, you, know, <laughs> you know, and you know, you know that, that's kind of death in a, in a piece, because if people start looking at their watches, it means they're not in the piece, you know? They're not in, in the pace of the, of the drama. And that's very, very important to me. So w Workshops are very valuable. Workshops, very valuable, and that's what I learn is yeah. mostly about dramaturgical pacing and how I can work with a librettist and director and conductor to make the right cuts and the right choices so that the piece is really, really smooth and, and very tight. Um, and then with any world premiere, I and you know, for the first production, I usually insist on five weeks of rehearsal so that we really have a chance to work on it in case there's anything that needs tinkering. Because by then, the singers are expected to show up with everything memorized. So asking them to re-memorize or relearn something is very demanding and very tricky because in something as massive as an opera. 
but it, it's still doable. You can do little things. Are you changing the orchestration during that period because you get voice balance with um, the sound? Yeah, a little bit. You know what was amazing with Moby Dick? We really didn't have to change anything. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I learned, I've learned so much from just writing in this form and working in different sizes because Dead Man Walking was huge. And Patrick Summers, when I was working with him, he said, when you're orchestrating this, err on the side of over orchestrating. Because again, it's much easier to cut something than it is to take the, t the break and write something in. You know, but I can call out bassoons, tacit, the next 20 measures. That's easy. You know, so uh, I learned a lot from that. And then my next opera was The End of the Affair, which was six characters and a 24-piece orchestra um, and no chorus. And then the next piece was Three Decembers, which was three characters and 11 players. And then in the meantime, I wrote a, a one act for a Baroque orchestra, something else for a chamber ensemble. So learning about combinations and balances that work. So when I got to Moby Dick, actually, it had been 10 years since Dead Man Walking, and I'd learned so much that I just wrote with Tremendous confidence. It actually shows because not only do I think the music shows great growth professionally, but the balances are so good. It's one of the okay. few new operas I've attended where I could really hear every word, yeah. and yet it wasn't because the orchestra was mm -hmm. quiet. Yeah. They, they were, the voices were additional instruments yeah. that completed the orchestration. Yeah. I think that's where my love of chamber music comes in. Um, because if you can think of an opera as a massive piece of chamber music, where the intimacy and those connections are so important from every single person, and uh, I don't know if any of you are musicians, but you rehearse a, you know, a piece of chamber music by yourself, and it's really hard because you don't have the complete picture, and an opera is that way too. And if it's done really well, the only time you really feel that it's unified is when you finally hear everyone together. So exciting to hear the complete picture. Um, but to have that sense of intimacy, you know, to think of an opera the size of Moby Dick as a chamber work on a massive scale, I think is really thrilling. Now, Dead Man Walking was a huge success at the very beginning. I don't know of any composer who had his first work come to life so much and be taken around the world so quickly. I think Puccini and Verdi would have been rather envious <laughs> had, had their first works done that. I'll take their work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but not, their, not their royalties. No, I now, would be happy to take those too. In, uh, <laughs> in the case of Moby Dick, when you see it again, do you rethink anything or is the work put to bed now uh, and that's it? I always doubt myself. So that's why I have friendly ears mm -hmm. around and people telling me whether they thought it was too long or too short. And, um, you know, and I pay attention. I actually, I don't. I don't read reviews, but they matter tremendously. I mean, it's, it's, they matter a lot, and people who write them are passionate about it. And uh, I can't read them because I'll get the specific language in my head and it will torment me. But I do need to know whether they're good or bad. So my partner always reads, reads them and then he tells me whether it was good or bad, and also if there's a particular spot that keeps coming up or not. And there, in this piece, there didn't seem to be. And from the, the friendly ears around me, I also didn't get that sense either. There was one place that we, I shortened at the very end, and we tried it out in Adelaide, and now it's permanent in the score. Um, but that's really the only thing we changed. Uh, it's an overwhelming process, writing an opera. Uh, again, you live with it, for, well, I live with it for years. Um, the, those characters, their music, their journeys, getting to know them so well, but then one thing that I'm very lucky with is after I've written the piece and I've seen it produced and I've gone through that, I've gone through that whole birthing process, it really is this process of about six months to a year where suddenly it just leaves me, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't feel like mine anymore. I know how it goes, I know how I want it to go and how it should go um, because I feel like I sort of channeled it through, but uh, it doesn't belong to me anymore in a, in a sense. And so I finally, I gain perspective. Um, and and the, the, work, the work feels very strong. Um, and it feels like a work where I want, I want to hear what different singers and actors will bring, bring to it, and directors eventually. You know. yeah, so at the moment, this um, five-company consortium yeah. that made it possible, 
are all using the same physical resource, mm -hmm. sets and costumes, and mm -hmm. the stage director. Mm -hmm. but, but you're right, when it breaks out mm -hmm. with another concept, mm -hmm. another director mm -hmm. interpreting the words differently, yeah. it, it must be rather exciting, because Terribly that happened exciting. with Dead Man terrifying. Walking. Terrifying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it can be terrifying. <laughs> um, yes, I've seen a couple of productions of Dead Man that I'd rather Forget about. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, I but that's mean, where you've got to let the baby you've go. You've just got to let it go. And, yes. and the fact is, if if the piece still has power despite you know a production that I don't particularly care for, you know, that's actually that's fine. Mm. I mean, because I I want to be surprised too. And and uh, and if I've written a piece that has many possible interpretations and perspectives. That's a, that's a really good thing. If it can only be yeah. done one way, I'm, I'm probably in trouble. You, know? yeah, you definitely would be, because yeah. every singer brings a different feeling to the piece. Yeah, Even yeah. though it's those words and that yeah. music, yeah. there's still interpretation that can be there, and it's got to be there also right. with the conductor right. and the stage director. Right. It's still your music, but they shape it differently mm -hmm. according to the resources well, they have. Yeah, and also each, each singer brings their own life experience to it. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting hearing um, J. Hunter Morris sing Ahab in Adelaide um, because he had just come off of singing Siegfried at the uh, San Francisco Opera over the summer and then suddenly he's got a peg leg on and you know he's singing uh, Down Under um, and he brought a totally different energy than Ben Hefner. It was really interesting but he really made it his own. I was very proud of him and very impressed because Ben was so powerful and ferocious in it but that was greatly reassuring too because it, it, it means that other singers will find other aspects of Ahab. Um, let's hear a little bit more of the music. Sure. Because I know you've got another piece that yes. we can hear. Um, towards the end of Act One, um, the, uh, the character of Starbuck um, has a, a soliloquy. Earlier in the piece, he, of course, he's the one who sees Ahab's madness. He sees what's going on. He sees um, how the crew has just been completely sucked in to that vision. Um, they're all committed to chasing Moby Dick and killing him. Um, and at one point, Pip falls overboard and is, um, and is rescued by Queequeg and um, goes a bit mad. So things are starting to go awry. And then he's told they've, they've finally been allowed to hunt a whale. And while they're rending the oil from the whale in the triworks on the ship, uh, he's told that the barrels are leaking. So he goes to tell Ahab that they have to find a port for repairs or they're going to lose everything. And Ahab won't do it. And that's when Starbuck finally confronts him and says, this is insanity. You know, wh what will the owners of this ship say? And Ahab basically says, to hell with the owners. You know, I have, uh, we have a mission. We have a voyage. And uh, when Starbuck rebels, Ahab takes a gun off the wall and has him has Starbuck kneel execution style and is about to kill him and suddenly changes his mind and Starbuck leaves. And he goes back to the cabin later that night to confront Ahab about what happened and he finds the captain asleep with his leg off, completely vulnerable. And he goes into the cabin and he sees the musket that he was going to use to shoot him and he has a real to be or not to be moment. <laughs> very powerful. And what, what I found in this, um, in this very moving uh, scene uh, was a convergence of these, these different themes. We had this sort of fate, call me Ishmael theme. And out of <clears throat> Queequeg's theme, the who wrote this? <laughs> Remember I told you it goes? <laughs> um, out of that suddenly came this, these undulating up and down uh, patterns, which, which suddenly became... And then suddenly developed into Starbucks' main theme, which became this very Puccini-esque kind of theme. So it went from
And that developed out of all of those different themes. So it's the culmination of the act. This is the scene that ends the act. And while Starbuck is in the room, Ahab is having a nightmare, and he cries out in his sleep halfway through, which again, suddenly Starbuck, who is a devout Quaker, is faced with this real conundrum. You know, and we all have to ask ourselves with it, because Ahab hasn't done anything yet, but he knows that something terrible is going to happen. So does he have the right to kill the man who might be the ruin of all of these people? But if he does that, he'll certainly be court-martialed, and he himself will lose his life and his family. So what does he do? This is a Starbucks a soliloquy. We're starting a, a couple minutes into, um, into the scene. The baritone there was Morgan Smith, and he sings it in San Diego as well. And the chap doing the ah, uh, ah, uh, ah uh, was, of course, Ben Hepner, who has <laughs> more words to sing than that. We, had a lot of, we actually had a lot of discussion about how he wanted to do those cries in his yeah. sleep. You know, we had a discussion of, like, what is he dreaming? Um, you know, what, what, is he actually asleep? Um, you know, we, we, it was very interesting having all those discussions, you know. I think he is actually asleep, and I think he's dreaming about Moby Dick. I think so, too. You know, he's, he's remembering the pain, you know, and I also think, you know, that's part of what both Ben and Jay found physically in that character, is that the torment of walking around on that leg all the time, it was, it was uh, uh, if you think about an actual person having to do that, they actually, we're, we're uncomfortable because the, the, the stage is raked. They're, they're walking around on a peg leg with a cane. Plus, at one point, the, the hardest music of the night is during a storm scene when they're up in a cage 30 feet above the stage on the peg leg singing. And uh, the, the leg itself is, is um, there's a, a harness and there's a, a thing and there's all kinds, they have to be sort of buckled in so that there's the least amount of strain possible. There actually are actual two leg. legs. There's a Jay Keggy leg, uh, the, or, or Ben Hepner leg, yeah, rather. I have uh, mine. Jay Keggy's got his own leg. <laughs> he does everything to feel the realistic right, right. aspects of the role. Are you saying this is an opera with legs? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, let's say I don't see a fin-ish coming for it. Uh, oh. Now, the, the leg actually had to be specially constructed yeah. for, for Ben Hepner for the shape of his knee. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Jay Hunter Morris yeah. has a different knee. There's a second leg. Yeah. And it is one of the issues that everybody who does this yeah. opera may need to have a leg specially yeah. fitted oh, yeah. for the tenor who's doing it, because standing on it for hours yeah. Uh, is very, very demanding, and we all have a different shape kneecap when the leg is yeah. bent and so on. <laughs> ben, ben said to me, the first time I played it for him, I said, now, which, which leg do you think you'll have the, the peg leg on? He goes, peg leg? <laughs> I said, yes, Ahab has a peg leg. And he said, oh, I hadn't thought about that part of it. And suddenly he realized, oh my gosh. So he decided to learn the whole role with the leg, you know, starting from scratch, like just learning in Toronto where he lives at home, you know, practicing singing on one leg. Yeah. There, there aren't very many operatic roles that require something like that. I mean, <laughs> there's an eye patch, but that's a little different. And, and there's, a, there's a hunt for Rigoletto, yes, yes. But, but that kind of thing is just not done. Yeah. Well, look, we've, we've come a long way. We, we've come from Dead Man Walking through to Moby Dick yeah. and, and this conversation. That's how we got here. You asked me at the beginning. Right? Conversation has to come to an end, I'm afraid. <laughs> but I want to thank you. I want to congratulate you because uh, you. when I was at the workshop, as somebody who had contributed to take this risk mm -hmm. on you, which I felt was not a risk, <laughs> it was a relief yeah. to oh, hear yeah. the whole thing come to shape and say, the investment's a good one. For, for everybody. <laughs> so thank you, and thank you all for being here. And uh, <laughs> see you at Moby Dick.